Oh, look at you purring. Okay, any second now you're gonna meow because you're super loud all the time. But look, you're a movie star now. Say hi to your, your viewers. Okay, or don't. I mean, that's really what movie stars do anyway. Okay, bye. Good. So, for the last um, portion of chapter eight, we are going to talk about collisions in two dimensions and how that makes our problems a little bit, uh, we have to take a little bit more care to set them up, uh, but otherwise they are the same general um, process of the one-dimensional collisions. And then the last portion of chapter eight, we're going to talk very briefly about rockets. Um, we're going to talk about that as a concept, the same kind of way that we talked about drag force briefly without doing any quantitative problems with it. So the new section of the chapter has to do with the fact that momentum is a vector, because these velocities we, we've been dealing with are vectors. And so when we look at the equation, we notice those little arrows over the velocities because these are vectors. And if we have a vector at an angle, we break it up into components. We break it up into horizontal x components and vertical y components. And so when we actually write down what that looks like in two dimensions, it looks a little bit messy. The subscripts look kind of overwhelming, but they're needed because for every single velocity piece in this pair of equations, we need to know the difference between object one and object two. We need to know the difference between the start of the problem and the end of the problem. And we need to know the difference between the horizontal direction and the vertical direction. So we have all three of those um, descriptors in the subscript. The momentum is still conserved in these situations, but it is conserved separately in the horizontal direction and then separately in the vertical direction. So we will see this example as a fully worked solution where if we look at the situation, this one starts out trying to be as um, kind of simple a starting point for us as possible. That at the beginning we have something moving just sideways, so it only has an x component of the velocity. And then we have something that is at rest. So lots of um, things that we'll be able to set to zero, and we'll see that in the example video itself. And then in the final um, situation, the three kilogram mass is moving away at an angle, which means we have a final velocity in the x direction, three cosine 50 degrees, and a final velocity in the y direction, three sine 50 degrees. And we'll have to figure out how to find the final x velocity for the other puck, the final y velocity for the other puck, and then put them together back into a triangle. We'll see that all in a separate video. The other example that we're going to look at as a fully worked example are these two masses that are both moving at the start of the problem and then they stick together at the end of the problem. And so in this case, we'll have to realize that they will both have the same final x velocity and the same final y velocity and then we put those together in a triangle. You're going to come back? Okay. So Maura is going to teach us about rockets. Okay, maybe she won't. And even now, this slide won't really um, seem like it's talking about rockets quite yet. So in this example, we have a man standing in an ice rink holding a yellow shoe. Who knows why he got that yellow shoe? He clearly has shoes of his own, but that's okay. If he's standing stationary, then the whole situation has no momentum, right? What we want to think about is what is going to happen if the man throws that shoe to his right or to the right on our page. So if you need to, pause the video to think about what's going to happen. Now remember, this is a frictionless surface. So once we realize that there's no momentum at the start of the problem, we might remember the recoil problem that we had at the beginning of the chapter that, um, for example, 8C, we had two people standing on ice that pushed um, against each other and moved in opposite directions. So this guy throwing the shoe in one direction means he will move in the opposite direction. 
This doesn't look like rockets, but I promise it is, because the way that rockets really work is they are constantly throwing yellow shoes, or maybe um, fuel particles, out in one direction, so the rocket can move in the opposite direction. In a rocket, at the very heart of it, it is simply a momentum conservation equation. Hot gases are coming out of the rocket in one direction, moving extremely fast and having a lot of mass. And then the rocket goes in the other direction. And at the beginning of this situation, it's not moving very fast because it has a lot more mass than what it's getting rid of. But eventually it speeds up and speeds up and is able to do its rocket thing. And so maybe for the rest of our lives, when we think about rockets, we'll think of them as like throwing yellow shoes out the bottom. And if we look at, for example, the space shuttle program that we used to have, the space shuttle, all of that really, really hot um, fuel coming out the thrusters there, the whole point is that it is throwing mass in one direction, a lot of mass moving very quickly, so that that other part of the system can move in the opposite direction. It is a momentum conservation equation, and it doesn't actually matter whether there is a floor for that um, stuff to hit or not. And one of the interesting things to recognize is that when rockets were first proposed as an idea, there were a lot of scientists who said that they wouldn't work in space because in space there's no air to push against. So it's a misconception that we somehow need to be able to like push against in order to push itself forward, like pulling yourself up a rope Instead, the way that this is working is we send momentum in one direction so that the rest of the system's momentum can be in the opposite direction. And that's where the equal and opposite idea comes from, so that the total system has zero momentum just like it did at the start. So now we know more about rocket science than those early scientists did. Perfect. And if you're getting really bored at home and you have some straws and balloons, you could even build your own rocket. Where if we look at either of these situations, in both of these simple at-home rocket examples, we can fill a balloon with air and hold it shut. Either we're holding the straw shut in the cart on the right side of our screen, or we're holding the balloon itself shut on the left side of the screen. When we let it go, the air goes in one direction and the rest of the system goes in the opposite direction. The only reason that we aren't doing full problems in the homework for rockets is because as that fuel, the air in these simple examples, the actual fuel in rocket problems, as the fuel is being sent out of the fuel tank, the mass of the rocket plus fuel tank is getting smaller. And so that changing mass actually means that we have to use calculus to handle the momentum properly. We don't have that, and so we won't do rocket problems in a quantitative way, but that doesn't mean we can't have fun thinking about rockets um, here in Chapter 8. And so that is all of the lecture portion of Chapter 8. We have four lecture videos just like before. We have, um, I think, a total of um, eight, maybe plus or minus one, eight examples to think through for and look at and practice with for these um, different collision problems and momentum conservation problems. So I will see you in the next chapter.